This episode of the Tony Robbins Podcast is brought to you by Tony Robbins Results Coaching. Are you ready to experience an extraordinary quality of life? Or maybe you're already doing well, but you know you can take your life to a whole new level. To do that, you have to set yourself up to win. You need a process, a way to consistently grow and produce the results that you need. That's what a Tony Robbins Results Coach can do for you. Whatever area in your life you want to change, your relationship, your health, your career, your business, coaching is one of the most valuable tools you can have. It's an investment in yourself, and it can yield some of the highest returns. Tony Robbins Results Coaches are hand-selected and trained by the master of coaching, Tony Robbins himself, to have the skills that will empower you with supreme focus, powerful insight, and the accountability needed to achieve everything you've ever dreamed. To help you get started, Tony is offering podcast listeners a free results coaching strategy session with one of his top coaches. It's a $200 value, and you're getting it for free. Visit TonyRobbins.com slash results. Schedule that free session today. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Tony Robbins podcast. This is Tony Robbins. I'm here with my co-host, Mary B. Mary Buckeye. Here we go, Tony. I'm excited for this one. I am too, and I think you're going to be as well. This is a very special podcast. I might get emotional on this piece because this man was a true mentor to me and to so many men that I respect and love. Um, everyone's looking for the competitive edge in life. Like, how do we compete? How do we, in a world that's so competitive, how do we win? How do we be the best that we can possibly be for ourselves, for our businesses, for our lives, for our families? And probably the greatest coach, certainly one of the greatest coaches alive that ever lived, I should say, and the greatest coach in the history of college basketball, hands down, is Coach John Wooden. Here's a man who, in a 29-year career, check this out, won 664 games and lost only 162. I'll do the math for you. That means he won 80.4% of the time over three decades in a sport where, if you can imagine, you're having a new set of players every year. It's not like you know, you're know you part of, you know let's say, the old Chicago Bulls and you've got Michael Jordan every year, that same team. You lose those best players every three, four years. So, But in, the most powerful thing is in his last 12 years of coaching, he won 10 NCAA national championships, something no one has done in history and most people believe never will happen again in history. But the most amazing thing about this human being is he didn't just build a basketball dynasty. He was a molder of character, a molder of emotion, a molder of men. Some great men came out of that UCLA program. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar won three titles with Coach Wooden. Reggie Miller, Bill Walton, Kevin Love, Steve Alford all played under Wooden. Yeah, and Kareem is a friend of mine. He actually is writing a book on his life, so you should watch for it when it comes out. He always talked about how Coach... He's a coach always taught us self-discipline, but the most powerful part of him is he was always his own best example. And I think if you want to know what made Coach Wooden go, is this man lived everything he teached. He walked his talk. And that's why he was able to influence these young men who were pretty spirited in those days. That's right. Back in my days at ESPN, before I found you, Tone, I used to love some of my favorite stories to read by some of the other columnists and writers were always about John Wooden. All the greats had these stories of just like what a character he was on the golf course, in the, in the practice arena, how he would tell guys how to tie their shoelaces, their <laughs> socks, like every single detail. Just such a beautiful man, so beloved. When people would go out and make like what would be considered a three-point shot today, in those days, he'd say, show me a hundred, you know, of these free throws or he'd say show me a hundred layups in a row his entire thing was it was all about execution he didn't care how cute it was or how great a shot from a distance he wanted to make sure that you never miss the details and part of that came from his upbringing he he taught common sense which of course is not too common anymore unfortunately because we all blow it off but what you'll learn is he shared that his father gave him a seven point creed right before he when he was graduating from grammar school and he said this if you do these seven things, your life will be extraordinarily fulfilling, alive, and successful. And he said, first, you have to be true to yourself. Second, make each day your masterpiece. Third, help others. Fourth, drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. Five, make friendship a fine art. Six, build a shelter against a rainy day. And seven, pray for guidance and give thanks for blessings every day. And that seems so simple. But this man in the 1930s was practicing this discipline and it guided every decision he made in his life. He kept it on a card that his dad had given him literally from grammar school and it guided his whole life. When I interviewed him, he pulled it out of his wallet and showed it to me. That along with, of course, his pyramid of success, which was extraordinary. But one of the things that I love most about him is this man was not just quotes, everything he completely lived. Share a few of your favorite. 
I love that, you know, I just recently, first of all, after you listen to this Power Talk, you got to check out his TED Talk, too. I know, I didn't even know he had a TED Talk. It's amazing. It's as cute as you would imagine. He's as true as he could possibly be. My favorite quote, I love to remind Big Tone of this, of course, is John Wooden said, be quick, but don't hurry. (laughs) (laughs) I like to just remind Tony Robbins of that once in a while. I think John Wooden would be proud. (laughs) Yes, he definitely had a different tempo for things. (laughs) What are some other ones that have stood out for you, Mayor? Uh, just the way, you know, his focus on character and, of course, I'm um, such a romantic, his love affair with his dear Nell. Oh, my God. Passed. You're going to start making me cry on this one. Yeah. yeah, he, every month from the time she passed, and he lived 25 years past her lifespan, he wrote her a love letter. And when I was at his home, he took me in and showed me that he never sleeps on her side of the bed. And there, tied with this beautiful ribbon around it, was this stack of all these love letters he wrote her each each month, um, it just it was it was you couldn't have a dry eye. I don't care how hard you are. I'm a, I'm a softy anyway, but such a beautiful man. But it also just as you said, his focus was to be you know, his quote was always be more concerned with your character than your reputation because his whole thing was you got to focus on things you can control. You can't control what people think of you, but you can control who you are. And it was more important for him how he how these men turned out as human beings than it ever was even just how they performed. And, you know, a lot of people out there ask me about coaching, and he had a great quote. He said, a coach is someone who can give correction without causing resentment. Whenever I see somebody, a parent or a business coach or a CEO, and they're, they're not effective, it's because... The state in which they coach people makes people feel judged. And I've always said to people, you can't influence someone if you're judging them. But if you really care, it's really hard to have not be able to reach someone if you're consistently caring, not you're caring today. Um, And then, you know, I think the only other thing I'd mention is that, because I want to get you right into the podcast pretty quick here, is that his whole mindset was talent was God-given, so be humble. That fame is man-given, so you better be grateful (laughs) because it can be taken away so quick. And conceit is self-given, so you better be careful. I I think uh, his definition of success was the thing that impacted me most. I've shared it with so many people. I've coached billionaires, uh, some of the top financial traders in the world over the years. Whenever they've gotten a tough space, I've always reminded them, you're not defined by your moment, by a moment. It's what you are consistently like. And Coach Wooden, I remember when I was talking to him, I don't know which interview it was, uh, but it was early on, maybe even in the very first interview. I don't know if it made it in. But when I asked him what would his be the greatest, most successful team, the team he was most proud of, and I assumed it would be like Cream's team, right? You know, three championships and, mm-hmm. and you know, they're one of the greatest. They won 88 games in a row. I mean, how do you do that, right, over yeah. multiple years? And he didn't pick that team. He ne- You'll hear it. I think it's on the podcast here on the end. I think you'll hear. He names a team I'd never heard of. And I said, why would you pick them? They didn't perform at the highest level. He said, because they were the team that maximized their potential more than any other. They did the most they humanly could with who they were. And his definition was really simple. He always told people, and I've used this in my own life, and I hope you'll use it in yours, and you'll hear it echoed from him in the podcast, but it was this idea that you can't control whether you're going to win or lose. And there's only one way you know whether you win or lose, and that is by measuring yourself. Did you give every ounce of yourself, every moment you're on that court? And and he said, you know, that you can control. And he said, if every moment on that court you gave every ounce of your soul, and I'm emotionally even thinking about it because it's been my life motto, then you will always know that you won because you gave everything. Because what we give is what we keep, and what we fail to give is the only thing that we lose in this life. And... His mindset was, you know, if you give everything, every moment on the court, and we all do that together, then most of the time you're going to win. You're going to have the highest score. But if you don't, there are times when someone will get lucky or a bad call or whatever it is. You can lose the game, but you've not lost the game of life because that's all That's all it's about. So I'm choked up by this man even now, 30 years later. I hope you'll be as touched as him. I know you will as, as well. And if you want to know how to have the edge in life as a parent, as a friend, as a business person, as an athlete, you're about to learn from the best coach that ever lived. My dear friend and the friend of so many, the one that led and mentored so many, the great coach from UCLA, Coach John Wooden. Let's join him now. And now we'll go back to 29-year-old Tony Robbins to hear his power talk with the man of principle, the great coach John Wooden, who would be 106 on October 14th, 2016. 
Hi, this is Tony Robbins. Welcome to the interview portion of Power Talk. And I'm especially excited and privileged today to be able to sit across the room from a legend, a man who has continually touched people's minds and hearts and made sports history. And that is none other than Coach John Wooden. Coach, I really want to thank you for letting me come here to your home to visit with you. Thank you, Tony. I consider it a privilege to have the opportunity to chat with you for a while. Well, thank you, sir. Coach Wooden was a man who, in his 27 years as a coach at UCLA, produced a level of basketball quality and quality people, I think, and I think as a teacher, that's really what he pursued, that has been unmatched. In his last 12 years with UCLA, he won 10 national NCAA championships, unheard of. A quote from a gentleman named Jim Murray, who's the L.A. Times uh, famous sports writer, said that what Newt Rockney was to football and what Connie Mack was to baseball and what Wilbur and Orville Wright were to flying, John Wooden was to basketball. Those are pretty big comments to make about a legend like yourself, Mm -hmm. and I know you don't see yourself that way because you're so humble and and you come from a different place, but maybe you can tell us where did all this start? I think it started in my early days uh, when I was uh, raised on a farm in southern Indiana, South Central Indiana, I should say. Uh, And I think primarily uh, from my father and mother and uh, perhaps a grade school principal. Uh, I went to a small three-room grade school, but uh, the principal had a remarkable effect on me, uh, which you don't realize at the time, but later on. And my father, too, who I... Uh, with only a high school education, I think he's probably as wise a man as I've ever uh, come across. Uh, tremendous common sense. And one of the things that he tried to get across to me and my three brothers, which I didn't appreciate probably at the time, was that you should never try to be better than someone else. And uh, if he stopped there, uh, it would leave you, I think, wondering, but he didn't stop there. He said, but you should never cease to try to be the very best that you could be. Yes. And when you think about that, and uh, later on it came back to me and had a lot to do with my uh, uh, own definition of success, which I coined in 1934, that uh, when you get involved uh, too much in the things over which you have no control, it, it's obviously going to uh, adversely affect the things over which you have control. And I think uh, that uh, came back to me later, and the things that we did on the farm, reading at night, and I think probably it's the reason of my enjoyment for poetry. There wasn't television or radio or things, and but Dad would read to us at night, and I think it's uh, perhaps while he didn't have the financial means to help any of us uh, go to college, I think probably he's the primary reason that I and my three brothers all graduated from college, all became teachers. Wow. I know he gave you a creed to live by at some point. Maybe you could share a little bit about that. Is it true also that you still carry it with you? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, when I graduated from this grade school, They sort of made a thing out of graduation from grade school. I'd say that we put on our best overalls. (laughs) (laughs) All three of you, huh? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, he gave me this creed and a $2 bill, an old uh, $2 bill, very large at that particular time. And I I would like to say I still have it, but I didn't give it to my son, so he would have it. Oh, that's nice. But he gave me that $2 bill and said, as long as you keep this... uh, You'll never be broke. And uh, then he gave me a seven-point creed, and uh, he just very simply said, uh, son, try to live up to this. And uh, the points were something like this, be true to yourself and uh, help others and make each day your masterpiece and drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible, and uh, build a shelter against a rainy day and make friendship a fine art and... uh, I give thanks for your blessings and 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 uh, pray for guidance every day. Wow, and it sounds like you've really that's been a major focus throughout your whole life. I wouldn't try to say I've lived up to it, Tony, but I would. <laughs> I, I've tried. You've done a pretty darn good job. From every person that I've talked to who's ever worked or played for you, uh, they say you really live by that creed and that you really walk your talk, Coach. I know you had some experiences early on that shaped some of your values. Uh, I remember reading, I think, in your book where you shared that uh, at one point, I guess, one of your brothers threw manure on you, and you had a unique reaction to that, and so did your father, and I guess it shaped some of your future values. Would you share that with us? Well, we were cleaning out adjoining stalls uh, in the barn, and uh, my brother 
threw a pitchfork of manure over on me and hit me, and I was very, very mad, of course, and I went after him, not with the pitchfork, but uh, he was three years older than I. I couldn't do much good against him at that time, but I, d- I didn't think about that at the time, and I went after him, but in doing so, I called him a name. I'm ashamed about it, but I did, and uh, my father overheard, and uh, he gave me a, quite a uh, about the only th- real spanking of that type, I think, that he ever did. But I knew I had it coming, and you don't... Uh, when you know you deserve something, uh, even if it's bad, you can accept it much better than the things <laughs> yeah. that you feel you don't deserve. Yes. But I must say that he also uh, gave my older brother probably one just as harder, harder. And what did you learn from that experience? Well... <laughs> To control your temper, for one thing, and, uh, and as far as uh, using uh, profanity. I don't believe since that time. No player, no friend, uh, no official has ever heard me use profanity. Yes. And I probably had something to do with it. I understand you also, one of your major philosophies in life is that you don't believe in allowing people to go through emotional peaks, at least on the basketball court, and that you want people to be prepared and be able to enjoy their successes in a unique and balanced way. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. My players uh, would probably tell you that they never heard me mention winning. I don't think scores indicate that you uh, won or lost. I wanted no excessive uh, jubilation because you outscored somebody in a game or excessive dejection if you were outscored. I wanted them each and every day to just do uh, the best they could to improve themselves and and not let a day go by with doing that because uh, that's a day lost that you can never recover. And... um, I never wanted and tried to get these ideas across. And you can't just tell them once and think they have it. The last of our laws of learning is repetition. And I would repeat them, but maybe not in the exact words, but getting the idea across day after day. Uh, For example, I would say that after uh, a game, if you uh, met someone that didn't know the outcome of the game, I hope they wouldn't be able to tell by your actions. I, as I say, I want no excessive jubilation or excessive dejection. Feel good when you've prepared yourself, and, and you're the only one that really knows. You can fool a coach, and you can fool everybody but yourself. And know that you have prepared yourself to perform uh, near your own particular level of competency. It may be that the other fellow's level of competency is just better than yours, and <laughs> there's nothing to be ashamed about in that. But there is something to be ashamed when you know that you didn't prepare yourself properly when you had the opportunity. So uh, that was uh, my idea, and, and I felt that that would have greater effect on the outcome of games than if I was uh, stressing in some other way trying to outscore opponents. That whole philosophy of really improving yourself versus comparing yourself to the other guy affected your scouting as well. I guess you really didn't scout teams to find out how they played. You wanted to develop a a plan that would work against anyone. That was my uh, philosophy. Uh, It's been said that I never scout an opponent, and that isn't true, uh, Tony, but I probably scouted less than uh, any other coach, uh, uh, certainly far less than anyone that I've ever known. Yes, I wanted to concentrate on what we could do and try to prepare yourself. Now, I needed to know something about the opponent, but I would, I could read and, and I could hear about uh, others, and, and I would know the coach, and I would know uh, uh, the coach uh, for whom he probably played, and I would know their general style, and I'd know whether they used a zone defense and what type of zone. I'd know whether they pressed. I'd know who were their better scores were, and I'd know from the type of offense they used uh, how that comes about uh, along with, the co- of course, their own individual ability. So I didn't want to talk about those things too much. I'm just trying to prepare my team in our practices against any eventuality. And preparation was the foundation of everything you taught. How did you really prepare your teams for games? By trying to get them to uh, execute near their own ability level. 
taking each game, it's an old trite statement that you play them one game at a time, but it, it's equally true. And if you start looking ahead, then you will not perform uh, as you're capable of performing. Or if you dwell in the past because you did real well in the past, that's gonna have, not going to have anything to do with how you're going to uh, perform uh, the next time. So you've got to prepare individually for each and, and every one and not let the, the what's happened before, what's likely to happen uh, in the future affect you, knowing that the only real way that you can affect the future is by what you do at the present. And, and uh, what's happened in the past cannot. Now, I wanted them to have respect for every team we played, regardless of how they had done prior to that. Don't fear them. And, and don't uh, give them no respect. You must respect everyone and just make the effort to execute near your own ability level. I know that repetition was a major part of what how you train people, as you said. It's one of the laws of learning. I think a lot of people in life avoid repetition. They think it's boring. What, what is your reaction to people who think repetition and, doing, and hearing the same things over and over again is boring? <laughs> yes, I think it's been said that... Uh, Consistency is the last refuge of the unimaginative. <laughs> but uh, I feel that that's the way habits are formed, is through uh, a consistent repetition. And uh, now I must change my drills a little bit, still teaching the same thing. And I might, as time goes by, uh, change the amount of time that I allow for uh, certain drills. Some groups will pick up a little quicker than others. You have to constantly be analyzing those under your uh, supervision. If you're not, and, and don't make it fun, I, I, Bill Walton recently on an interview said one thing about Coach Wood, he made practices fun. Even though we did the same things in many cases every day, there would be a little changes and he made them fun. Well, I never wanted him to feel it was a chore, but... I did want them to feel that during that hour and a half to two hours we're going to spend on the basketball floor, that's where I wanted their minds 100%. I don't want them thinking about other things, and if there are people up in the stands watching them, I don't want you performing for them. You're just working to Im improve yourself. Yeah, but as soon as practice is over, you're, you're not a basketball player. No, you're a student at UCLA, and that must be your main uh, consideration because that's why you're here. I know that uh, a lot of these values were installed in you by some of your coaches. I know at one time you were offered the opportunity to go play for the Celtics and go barnstorming across America for, uh, what was it, around $5,000 in those days when $800 a year was a huge sum of money? <laughs> uh, tell me about that. The old pro league broke up the year I graduated, and they were forming a, a barnstorming group consistent largely of the old uh, New York Celtics at that time, and the Cleveland Rosenblum Celtics is the name that they went under, under the new one, and they did offer me uh, $5,000. Well, I took a job at $1,500, where I uh, taught five English classes a day as athletic director and coached football, basketball, baseball, and track, and uh, I turned this down, but I, I went to my college coach, a man of extremely high principles, a very high principle man. And uh, I told him about this, and, oh, he said, that's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it sure is, yes. And he said, uh, is that what you came to Purdue for? I said, well, what do you mean, Mr. Lambert? And he said, uh, uh, to, to uh, go into professional athlete, athletics of that sort, professional basketball? I said, no, I, I, I didn't. I came to get an education. He said, did you get one? I said, I think so. And he said, well, I think you ought to take advantage of it. But that's a decision that you have to make. You have to decide <laughs> decide for yourself. But he was very wise in things like that. There were other things along that line that, that he did that uh, probably subconsciously uh, had an effect on me. Tell me a little about uh, Coach Wooden, the ball player. I know you're one of the, I think, the only person that's ever been elected into the College Hall of Fame for, as both a player and a coach. What were you like as a player? <laughs> well... I can only tell you what other people have said. <laughs> um, I'm proud of the fact that uh, I was uh, been selected in the all-time uh, high school basketball team in Indiana, and 
As a matter of fact, uh, Oscar Robertson and I were uh, selected as the starting guards on the all-time wow. team and on the all-time uh, college uh, team from Indiana. And, and I'm proud of that, but the game has changed uh, so much. And when I read and hear things that uh, list me uh, along, see, with either Oscar Robertson or one of those, I kind of chuckle because uh, I know it isn't true. And um, But I'm happy that I was considered to be one of the better ones of my particular era. I enjoyed playing. I was considered one of the better defensive players, and um, I, I'm very proud of the fact that at my senior graduation that my coach had said that uh, in spite of the fact that I'd just broken the Big Ten scoring record, that that never entered my mind, that I was one of the most unselfish players that he ever had and, and the best defensive player that he ever had. But more than that, he said what made that, I believe he's the best conditioned athlete for playing any sport that I've ever seen. Well, now, condition, I worked on. I knew that's something over which I had control. I didn't have control over my height. and The Lord had given me quickness and speed, and I could, by uh, proper execution and keeping balance, uh, and, and balance is more than just physical balance. So many people think of it in those terms, but you can't have physical balance unless you're mentally and emotionally balanced. That, yes. that must precede. Yes. It's like attaining condition. You can't attain the best condition unless you're the mental condition and, and moral conditioning precede it. But I know that the today's players and the things, no, I don't compare with those at all. But I enjoyed playing and enjoyed being considered one of the better ones of my time. How did you mentally prepare your teams and how did you physically prepare them? I know, uh, I remember you saying several times that uh, your teams might meet teams that were more skilled, but they'd never meet teams that were better conditioned. And it seems like you used the same strategy that you used in your own life with your teams. But how did you prepare them mentally and physically? Well, I would uh, tell them that we must be in the best possible physical condition. We may not be able to be better than others because maybe the other fellows try and do the same thing. But we do have control of our own conditioning. We must make the effort, and it's a combined effort. I have a responsibility to um, devise drills, and, uh, and I must study and analyze each one of you and have drills individual, and drills. Uh, some drills will be good for all, and some drills will be good just for certain individuals. I must know how to apply these drills in practice. I must not continue them too long. I must know as the season progresses how they're going to change, and I know how I'm, I must devise new ones to prevent monotony and uh, all of those things that I must do. But young men, you have a responsibility too. Your responsibility begins every day when practice ends until you return because you can tear down more between practices than we can possibly build up during practices. And I know that many of you are probably thinking I'm speaking of immoral conduct and certainly that isn't uh, conducive to the best physical condition, but we must just practice moderation in all things. And if you practice moderation in your eating and rest habits and other things, uh, uh, then with my living up to my responsibilities, we'll come close to uh, realizing uh, the physical uh, condition that we're capable of. We can't do it perfectly because no one can be perfect, but let's work toward that end. And I tried to get them to accept that and I'd say, now, if this is going to pay dividends for us, we must put pressure on our opponent from the very beginning, and not just on defense, but on offense. We must keep pressure. We must try the fast break every time, but we mustn't end with a bad shot. But we must make them move to get back and make them aware of that. And if we are in better condition, before the end of a half, it'll begin to pay dividends. And before the game is over, it will uh, pay dividends. Now, my problem was to sell that to the players. <laughs> and, when they were uh, exhausted. <laughs> I tried to do it, but I didn't condition by running laps or running up and down stairs or doing push-ups or running penny cup. Uh, games and things of that side. I did it through the individual fundamental drills. Uh, a shooting drill for us was a conditioning drill, the way I ran it. There was no resting in between, always working. Well, move, move, move was, the I think, the most famous phrase that <laughs> most of your players say that you used over and over again. And they said that uh, your practices, from what I understand, you would spend an hour designing a 90-minute practice that was literally to that level of precision. Um, did you do that regularly and consistently, and why? Yes, I did. I think I learned that uh, from high school and possibly uh, uh, from my uh, teaching English classes that I had to have a I had to have a plan 
I had to have a lesson plan for every day. And when I start, first started teaching, I understood that uh, in teaching English classes. I didn't understand it the way I should have in teaching uh, the various sports that I taught. But I learned that you must, we must be prepared. Otherwise, we're going to waste an enormous amount of time. As a matter of fact, Tony, I'd say uh, the, my years at UCLA, I probably spent uh, uh, two hours every morning with assistance when I had assistance. I didn't always have my last uh, few years I did have planning the practice uh, uh, session for that afternoon, which will never last over two hours and and uh, probably m- most of the season would be only an hour and a half. But it's practice the full time. It isn't uh, talking. I did very little. Uh, I'm talking while the drill's going on, talking yes. to individuals. I did more individual coaching in, in the, uh, that sense. Now, I have... Um, I don't have it now because I've given it to one of my friends in the coaching profession. But I could have given you every minute of every day of practice I ever had at UCLA. I kept it in a loose-leaf notebook, and when we planned it, I would uh, have it by the minute. And then I put that on. Some of my players called me the 3 by 5 man because I had our practices uh, uh, on a 3 by 5 card, which I would uh, watch carefully. My uh, managers had it, so they'd know that at this time they better have two balls at this basket and two balls there, and uh, players uh, would move quickly uh, from one to another. And when I planned a day's practice, I looked back to see what we'd done on the corresponding day last year and the year before. Now, that took care of every practice that any player I had in which he had participated because the freshmen were ineligible. So otherwise, I'd have gone back three years. And uh, after the day of practice is over, I sat down in, in the dressing room and, and um, wrote down some notes on the back of this 3 by 5 card about the practice. And then the next day, when I'm planning the practice the next day, I made uh, little notations along the, the indenture, along this theme paper about uh, certain things, that maybe this was uh, two minutes too long or, or I needed wow. two more minutes or things of that sort. And uh, by reviewing back and thinking and analyzing all that and then thinking in terms of what's coming up this weekend, uh, if we got into the season where we're playing games and who we're playing and where we're playing and so on, and analyzing and taking all these things in consideration. But I enjoyed doing that, and I enjoyed teaching. And, and you may have heard me say, uh, heard of me being quoted as saying that uh, Cervantes said, the road is better than the end. Yes. And I sort of, uh, I sort of uh, equate that with practicing and the games. And, and I think it was Robert Louis Stevenson said, uh, it's better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. Yeah. And that's about the same thing. And um, I really enjoyed it. And now, uh, since my retirement, I've been asked so many times, do I miss it? I miss the practices and working uh-huh. with the players and the planning of the practices. And I don't miss the games or the tournaments or all the other fall de roll. Well, the amount of precision that you've had in your instruction. I understand you kept statistics on the players even during practice, not just in games. Is that true? Yes, I did. There are many things. Now, I didn't keep uh, uh, as many statistics, but there are certain things that I wanted to know. I wanted to see what the trends were. I wanted to know, uh, and, and not depending completely on my memory. Yes. Uh, if you start depending completely on your memory... Uh, <laughs> well, I don't have that type of memory. <laughs> well, you've got 80 <laughs> so, years to remember. <laughs> I had, uh, I did uh, uh, that and certain things. I'd not, I wanted to see if uh, maybe uh, we were going too much to one side of the floor and then we weren't to the other. I want to uh, see if we were getting an equal number of, uh, approximate equal number of shots when we got into our five on five work for each position on the floor. And uh, 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 some players will get more just because they're more gifted. And can do more individually, but I wanted the vast majority of our shots, for example, on offense to come from within the framework of our team, uh, not an individual. I disliked one-on-one basketball and uh, wanted it to come out of the team, but there are times when you do have the one-on-one. So I wanted to primarily check trends. Uh, That's why I kept certain statistics. I know um, I've done quite a bit of research about the Japanese style of management. And, you know, uh, one of the philosophies that actually the, the most of Japanese businesses built on came from uh, Dr. <laughs> Edward Deming, who we talked about a little yes. bit earlier. And his whole philosophy is based upon the idea of never-ending improvement, that every day you must improve something and that you have to measure it so that you know that that's really true. How do your philosophies dovetail with Deming's or vice versa? Maybe his <laughs> with yours. Well, certainly... Uh 
that's my belief too that yes. uh, you never stand still you're either moving upward a little bit or you're going the other way a little bit uh, we can't expect to go upward too quickly but we can sure go down very quickly the slide <laughs> down can be in a hurry yes uh, progress um, comes um, uh, steady if you're preparing yourself for that and you're giving it the the consideration of all aspects that you should you must not uh, let adversity if you seem to be held up uh, bother you uh, because good things and these are the ideas that I tried to get across uh, all good things come through adversity and yet most people try to avoid adversity uh, yes and, and as someone said when I look back it seems to me all the grief that had to be left me when the pain was over stronger than it was before uh, and I believe that uh, you get stronger uh, physically through weights, diversity. You get stronger mentally through increasingly difficult subjects in school. You don't start out with calculus. You start out with arithmetic. Yes. And I think we get stronger uh, morally and spiritually through uh, through adversity to some yes. extent. So, and yet we do fear it. We don't want adversity, and yet it, that's what makes us better. We should learn from it, and and. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, should not fear it. You can't get stronger, say, in an athletic point of view, if you constantly are playing inferior opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you may start playing to their level. Yes. You've got to be challenged uh, to improve. Part of my job, I felt, as a teacher was to challenge the students under my uh, supervision. And uh, there's so many things that must be uh, taken into consideration for that. You, you may be, I'm, I'm probably sure you're familiar with some of the things that Wilfred A. Peterson has written. And uh, I, I picked up many years ago one on the art of living. Uh, and he has others. And I just recently uh, received another one from him. And um, under leadership, uh, he, he points out some things which I thought were true, but maybe didn't concentrate on them as much. For example... Uh, one that struck home very much is that uh, the leader must always be uh, concerned in finding the best way, not in having his own way. <laughs> and another one was that the leader must make sure that all, all those under his supervision know that they're working with the leader, not for the leader. Yes. And I think you have to do that. Uh, now, in, in my basketball teams at UCLA, they're not playing for me. Uh, I didn't want them to feel that, but we're all working together for a common cause. And uh, it's up to the leader to get that across and, and not get uh, lost in his importance. Then he becomes a dictator a type, and uh, that doesn't work out too well. It seems to me that uh, in reading some of the documents and talking to some of the people that you've coached, that you really coached with tremendous strength. You expected a tremendous amount from your players, but they all perceived that you cared very deeply for them, that you were a coach of love. Well, the coach whose philosophy I admired was Amos Alonzo Stagg, and uh, he once made the statement, uh, he never had a player he didn't love. See, he had many he didn't like <laughs> and didn't respect, but he loved them just the same. Well, I, uh, in my early years of, of uh, teaching, I would tell my players, I like you all the same, and I'm going to treat you all the same. Now, I never did. I was thinking that I was, but I wasn't. I didn't like them all the same. They didn't like me all the same. They didn't like each other all the same. Right. And yet I was saying that. And I never treated them all the same. I didn't want to uh, show uh, favoritism, but I think the surest way to show partiality and favoritism is to treat everybody alike. I think that's the surest way. Uh, I say, I'm going to try to give you the treatment you earn and deserve. And, and uh, I have to make the judgment on that, and I know that I'm imperfect, and I can be wrong, but... If I am, I'm once going to get caught up for it because this is my vocation. And, and uh, if I don't do things properly, uh, it'll be found out and then I'll be somewhere else. So uh, in many ways, it's little things like that are, that uh, uh, help you do well in the end more than the, the techniques of the game. Yes. What do you think you contributed most to these players? Again, I know your humble approach is uh, you don't take credit for things, but what, what did you really contribute to these players beyond the basketball field, on a basketball floor, rather? I would say that 
I'm most proud of the fact that practically all my players got their degrees and most all of them have done well in whatever professions they have chosen. I'm asked so much, uh, aren't you proud of all your players that played professional basketball? I said, yes, I'm very proud of them, as well as I am of the 20-some that are attorneys and the four ministers and the number of dentists and the number of doctors and the teachers and most of them, most of them, however, in business because most of my players at UCLA majored in some sort of business. And uh, while my two years at Indiana State, practically all my players... Um, became teachers and coaches, wow. but not too many, uh, a few at uh, UCLA, but not nearly uh, as many. So I'm very proud of them, and I'm more proud of that than I am, uh, uh, say, of championships. And if you would like, a little later, I'd like to play something for you that that means more to me than any championship oh, I wanna, we have, I, we'll end with that. I ever to had. That. Mm-hmm. What, what are some of the beliefs and values that you consciously really wanted to instill in these players that you thought would make a difference not only in the basketball floor, but again in their life? Well, I tried to get across my definition of success to them, which I think is far more than just playing basketball. And uh, my, my definition of success, which I coined in 1934, is peace of mind which can be attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing that you made the effort to become the best that you're capable of becoming. Now, without peace of mind, I don't think anyone has very much. They're always looking for something else, and uh, they don't see... well, the other side of the street always looks better. Yes. And uh, they're so different. My favorite American is Abraham Lincoln. And he had that wonderful ability to say so much in just a few words. I think his immortal uh, Gettysburg Address of some 268 words really says more than many volumes. Yes. But he said, it's better to trust and be disappointed once in a while than it is to distrust and be miserable all the time. <laughs> and oh, there's, wow. there's so much to that. And little statements like, uh, the worst thing you can do for those you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. Mm. And I could go on and on with many, many statements of just simple statements which have so much, so much uh, uh, depth uh, uh, to them. But I hoped that as far as my players are concerned, that they would uh, think of me afterwards not as much as their basketball coach, but as, as more or less a friend, a, a teacher. One was really concerned about them as individuals more than just as basketball players. Not that I wasn't. Of course, they're there in all probability because of their basketball ability. But once they're there, I want them to know that I'm far more concerned in them as individuals than I am as just basketball players. Well, that's clear to this day in hearing some of the interviews with these people. Tell me about when you first came to UCLA. Back was it 1948, wasn't it? That's correct. I, I, if I recall correctly, you had two choices, UCLA and I think Minnesota. That's correct. And you'd chosen Minnesota, but an interesting experience of fate caused you to come to UCLA. Maybe you can share that. <laughs> well, it was a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact... Uh, at that particular time, uh, Purdue was trying to get me to come back there very much, but they wanted me to stay at Indiana State for another year. And then they were going to let the coach go. And I didn't feel that was the right way to treat people. And I just decided I wouldn't be interested in Purdue. And uh, Minnesota was also wanting me, and, and UCLA. And uh, uh, they had both offered me the positions but there was a little hitch in the Minnesota in as much as they wanted me to keep as the assistant the coach that I was be, I was replacing. Now, they were not firing him. He wanted to be out, wanted to retire, but he still wanted to keep sort of a hand in it. And he was a fine man that I liked and enjoyed. But I just didn't feel that it would be best. I knew our philosophy of the game was different, and uh, I didn't think it would be best. And uh, they didn't have it in their budget for me to bring an uh, assistant with me. So um, UCLA had offered the job, and they wanted me to let them know by, I think it was 7 o'clock one evening in April. And uh, Minnesota, they were to let me call at 6 o'clock to let me know whether or not that they had worked out in the budget. There was a Board of Regents uh, meeting uh, with the Director of Athletics was going to be there with them. And uh, uh, he didn't call me at 6, and UCLA called at 7, and I accepted. And about 8, I got the call from Minnesota saying everything is all fine. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I've committed myself, and I can't back out on it. And uh, 
the reason they didn't get the phone, there was a uh, what they called an unseasonable uh, late snowstorm. I'm not sure that a, a snowstorm in April in Minnesota is, is <laughs> unseasonable or not. Yeah, but anyway, right. uh, that was the reason that he took, couldn't get the phone. The lines were down, and that's... Uh, I would have gone to Minnesota had they called at 6 o'clock. That is true. Well, I'd be curious about some of your beliefs about destiny, because um, I know that there are many experiences in your life like that. I know you were uh, stationed or scheduled, rather, to go off to war in the South Pacific, and you got appendicitis, and as a result, you didn't go, and the man who took your place was killed by a kamikaze pilot. Um, I mean, there have been a series of experiences like that. I remember reading about one of your associates, who later became an associate, Eddie Powell who uh, came to you. Maybe you could share that experience, but I'd be curious to know two things. Maybe you could share the story of Eddie Powell and what happened. Mm-hmm. And But secondly, I'd like to know, what are some of your beliefs about destiny? Do you think there's a certain amount of this is predestined for you, or is it a matter of choices? Is it a combination of the two? What are your beliefs in that area? Well, I'm not uh, particularly a fatalist, but yes, I do good. believe... I'm not either. <laughs> I do believe that, uh, that there are things that... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It's been said, you know, that... Uh, we may not know where our paths may lead, but we know they're being directed in some way. Mm-hmm. And I sort of believe that. And uh, things have happened that's been unusual. Now, Eddie Powell, uh, I had Eddie and his wife as English students in high school, and then, and then Eddie played for me on both basketball and baseball teams. He was a terrible basketball player, it seemed to me, practices and everything. And yet, on the other hand, uh, his sophomore year, year, he had a fine baseball player. And his second baseman, he made the double play well, and, and he was a good hitter and, and uh, was just a fine clutch player. He was on the basketball team, but he didn't get to play. I, maybe I kept him on the squad subconsciously because of the fact that uh, I needed him in the spring on the bas- on baseball. <laughs> but uh, we had uh, one time when he was his junior year, and it was early in the season, but we were rated. Now, there were three teams. They run ratings with the AP and UP and Indiana with the high school teams, just like they do in the colleges. And uh, there were three teams, or the top three, and they were... Uh, ourselves and uh, Fort Wayne Central and uh, a team from Gary, Frable of Gary. And it's uh, by a uh, quirk of the schedule somehow. Uh, they weren't in our conference, and this was before we'd opened our conference. We played um, on consecutive nights. We played Frable in Gary. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, then Fort Wayne Central, we played them in, in South Bend. And we had a tremendous game with Frable of Gary, and I think we ended up by winning at 47 to 45. And uh, Eddie, of course, didn't get in the game. He was on the bench, and he didn't get in the game because it was a tough game. I'm not going to put him in a game like that. <laughs> we went to a restaurant to have something to eat before driving back to South Bend. And Eddie sat over by himself. And I went over and said, come on, Eddie. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I might as well drop basketball. I'm not doing any good. and never get to play. And, and I said, oh, Eddie, you must never give up. You never can tell what can happen. And... Uh, uh, if you're not enjoying it, that's one thing. But uh, if you feel it's just because of a lack of playing, that would be wrong. And he said, Coach, he said, I know if you'd let me play with Eddie and Jimmy and Bobby, and I know that if I could play with them, I could play well. I never get to play with them, and, <laughs> and I know I could. And I said, Eddie, have you ever shown in in practices or games that you should be in there? No, but I know I could play if you'd put me in there. Well, I said, okay, Eddie, I'll play you tomorrow night against uh, uh, Fort Wayne Central. And boy, he lit up like this. And uh, then on the drive back, I said to my wife, who always went with me, and I said, honey, I, I, met, I pulled another one, I, another, another mistake. And she said, what would you do this time, honey? <laughs> and I said, well, I told Eddie that I'd start him tomorrow night and I said that's not right he said he hasn't earned it and he hasn't deserved it and I made a mistake and I must go through with it because I I gave my word and I must live up to it I said that didn't tell him how long he'd played though so <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you figured you put him in yeah, for a short time yeah. huh? <laughs> so I thought to, to convince him that uh Fort Wayne Central had a player who later became an All-American player at Indiana University and at that time was considered perhaps the best high school player in Indiana by the name of Armstrong. So I thought, 
he'll convince Eddie in a hurry. <laughs> and I put Eddie defending him. I use the man-to-man defense, of course, yes. helping, always helping on the weak side. Uh, my man-to-man defense is practically zone weak side. It's just man-to-man on strong side. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, to shorten it up, he held Armstrong to the lowest number of points he'd ever scored. He scored more points for us than, than he'd ever scored in all the games he'd been in put together. He got a number of rebounds and just played a tremendous basketball game and was selected, selected as our most valuable player at the end of the season and the wow. next season well and started every game from that time on. And uh, it was sort of odd that some of the reporters uh, said after the Fort Wayne game, Coach... You really were saving him for this game, were you? <laughs> it was just a farce, in a way, that that happened to come about. And it makes you wonder, how many, how many other young people have you missed yeah. because of something like that not happening? And I still say I made a mistake by telling him to do that, but I did tell him, and I, it was a good mistake, it turned out, because <laughs> I found a, a great competitor in there and played extremely well. Never practiced well after that either, but always played well. He got always up for the games. Well. Mm-hmm. So later well. became an assistant coach for you, didn't Yes, he? he did. Came out here with me after he was in the Marine Corps for five years, and he came to Indiana State hoping to play, but he had uh, developed varicose veins, and he just couldn't play, and he was... a. Yes. I used him as a student assistant. I had no assistant, and I used him as a student assistant because he's a very intelligent player. And uh, then when I came to UCLA, he still hadn't graduated, and he came out here with me, and I used him as a student assistant here, and he got his degree from UCLA and and is here, and I'll be attending uh, their wedding anniversary in a couple of weeks. Fantastic. He and Henrietta that were, uh, well, they're sort of like Nellie and I, uh, uh, I never went with anyone but Nellie, and he never went with anyone but Henrietta. So uh, they're very dear to us. That's neat. You offered him the challenge. You said that's what makes people grow. You certainly gave it to him, and he he met the the challenge. When you first came out to UCLA, um, I know there were quite a few promises made to you. One was the place to play, (laughs) which I guess you didn't get for almost 16 years. And uh, you also came out to a team that I think you were, if I remember correctly, a little bit disappointed with the base of talent that you had to start with. They were, I think UCLA's team back in 1948 was uh, selected to or predicted to place last in the league. What happened that first year? Well, Tony, I'm uh, correcting one thing that uh, has probably been misrepresented. I know I've never said it, but they didn't promise me a place to play. Oh, I see. But they led me to believe <laughs> okay. that uh, when my uh, uh, contract was up, that they were working on it, and there'd be a place to play by the time I'd finished my contract with them. So they didn't make, break a promise. Oh, okay. At all. I saw, though, before I'd been here too long, that it wasn't going to happen. Of course, right. it happened, uh, what, my 17th year, I guess it yeah. was. But uh, in seeing the talent uh, when I had them, I, I thought, oh, my. The team that I left at Indiana State, my team there, my first year I had 11 freshmen, one sophomore freshman were eligible then because of just the war just being over. And so I had them all back the next year. Now I'm going to have them for two more years. And, and they were good. They were getting better all the time. And I thought they'd have taken this UCLA talent and trounced them. Right. But UCLA had had some good players the year before, but they still hadn't done well. They'd had an outstanding player by the name of Don Barksdale, an All-American Olympic player. And they had uh, Davidge Miner, who'd played in Indiana High School and beat us out of a, an important high school game one time. And I remembered him very well. And then they had... Uh, George and John Stanis. John Stanis had graduated, and but George uh, was still there, and I had him. But the talent just didn't compare, actually. Uh, and I thought, my my, it, it's it's going to be rough. But we had the best year that UCLA had ever had, and won the conference. And uh, that one of the years has given me the greatest of a personal satisfaction. Well, how did you do that? How did you take this raw talent that didn't seem to be there and turn it into a championship team, and in, in one year? I started a different style of ball that wasn't played too much on the coast, and I think it caught a lot of others by surprise a little bit. Uh, uh, they hadn't used the fast break and been more or less ball control, and uh, these uh, players were conditioned to uh, playing uh, ball control basketball, and it seemed to me that they adapted very well to a different style, and that probably helped uh, them uh, tremendously. And uh, maybe other schools were down a little bit. I, that I don't know. I hadn't seen them before. But uh, I, I'm very proud of that particular group. I'm proud of, of any that won a national championship. 
I know that you said many times that um, that most basketball games are settled in the final five minutes and that uh, it's in those five minutes that you think you can win the games because the other guys are burnt out because you've, <laughs> you've, you've pressed them all game long and you've run them all game long. And Was that part of the strategy with your first teams? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I took that, I think, probably from going way back to my college coach. Uh, and I felt that... If, if you are in better condition, the only way uh, uh, to make it uh, pay dividends is to keep pressure on constantly, both offensively and defensively. So we tried to do that, and not too many were doing that on the coast at that particular time. Not that they weren't well coached. It was just a different style. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that really is true, and I think that was true at the end of my coaching. Generally speaking, if the teams are comparatively evenly matched, the better conditioned team will probably prevail. Only they'll be in a mental and emotional state to be able to execute, basically, as I a result think so. of that. That's interesting. What were some of the key ingredients you were looking for in your players? I mean, what were some of the things that you really expected from them or demanded from them in terms of qualities? I'd be curious. Well, I think from a physical point of view, the most important attribute that any player can have in any sport is quickness. But that quickness must be under control. If it isn't under control, you have a lot of activity but you have little achievement. And I don't want activity without achievement, which is another statement that I often use. Now, to have your quickness under control, you have to be uh, uh, balanced, uh, emotionally balanced, and mentally balanced. And uh, uh, so that's what you're working for. To have the physical balance, you have to be mentally balanced to know where your feet should be, where your head should be, where your hands should be, and how the joints should be relaxed, and all those things. That is uh, something that I tried to uh, concentrate on as much as possible. I think in life, there's two words that are important, love and balance. Now, maybe, maybe we just need the one, Tony. Maybe <laughs> love would take care of everything, and I think it would, true love would. But you have to have balance, and balance is keeping things in perspective, not letting yourself get too high, not letting yourself get too low, and, and uh, uh, keeping all areas of your life. Uh, you know, eating must be balanced. Uh, rest must be balanced. Everything must be in balance. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to get across. So I'm looking for quickness and then hoping that I can help uh, keep it in balance. Now, the next thing I'm looking for is teamwork. Yes. They must be concerned about the team more so than individual accomplishments. I try to point out that uh, if the team does well, there's going to be credit for all. If the team doesn't do well, uh, there's not going to be all that much credit. And, and you're all a part of the team. And um, so I'm trying to get that idea, and I you try to point that out in different ways, like describing them as a as a machine, an automobile, a powerful automobile. Now this player may be the the engine. Yes. But how good is that engine if a wheel is missing? Yes. It isn't going to take you anywhere, and you may be just a wheel on this team. But you're no good if we don't have a nut holding that wheel on. And you may be just a nut that's holding the wheel on, but there's a role for you, and it's very important. Uh, And uh, uh, some are going to be more publicized and more in the public eye, but you're all important, very important. The role that you you have is very important. And, And whether you players believe it or not, you need somebody in this car driving it. Because if you don't have me, you'll run in circles as sure as the world. So you need me a little bit. <laughs> and uh, that's just one way that I that's would wonderful. try to point out the attaining. I used to use uh, um, plays. You may have a leading character. If you don't have a good supporting cast, it won't be a play. It won't get many encores. Yes. You know, we, might, we won't do well on the road. You, you've got to have the supporting cast. So every, everyone is important. So that's what I want uh, I want players with a, what do we call an unselfish attitude yes. uh, that are concerned for the group as a whole. Now, Well, they didn't start out that way, some of them, though, did they? I mean, you're in a situation where you have a lot of players who had a fairly strong ego coming into your program. How did you deal with that? A coach has the greatest ally in the world, Tony, the bench. <laughs> <laughs> so pain is your ally. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not afraid to use it, if you'll put them on the bench, They'll come around. I found that to be very true. Uh, one of the finest forwards I ever had, his first year, he sat on the bench most of the time when he's easily the best forward. And he'd say, you know I'm better than those. I say, yes, I am. 
too bad you're letting them beat you out. And uh, until you think more in terms of the team or get your play, and he wasn't a selfish individual. He yeah. was just that's the way he had always played and had been brought up that way. It was hard to break. But when he, he uh, broke it the next two years, I thought he was the best forward in the country. Wow. But that one year he sat on the bench and watched others uh, 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 most of the time. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins and Mary Buckheit. Carrie Song is our executive producer. Strategy and distribution by Anna Yorg and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Copyright Robbins Research International. This episode of the Tony Robbins Podcast is brought to you by Tony Robbins Results Coaching. Are you ready to experience an extraordinary quality of life? Or maybe you're already doing well, but you know you can take your life to a whole new level. To do that, you have to set yourself up to win. You need a process, a way to consistently grow and produce the results that you need. That's what a Tony Robbins results coach can do for you. Whatever area in your life you want to change, your relationship, your health, your career, your business, coaching is one of the most valuable tools you can have. It's an investment in yourself, and it can yield some of the highest returns. Tony Robbins Results Coaches are hand-selected and trained by the master of coaching, Tony Robbins himself, to have the skills that will empower you with supreme focus, powerful insight, and the accountability needed to achieve everything you've ever dreamed. To help you get started, Tony is offering podcast listeners a free results coaching strategy session with one of his top coaches. It's a $200 value, and you're getting it for free. Visit TonyRobbins.com slash results. Schedule that free session today. Welcome back to the Tony Robbins Podcast. It's Tony's sidekick, Mary Buckheit, and we're going to cut right to the chase today and throw it to Tony for part two of the commemorative John Wooden interview from way back when Tony sat down with his beloved mentor some 20 years ago. We hope you enjoyed part one. Thanks again for listening. I'm sure you could hear in that first half of the interview how emotional Big Tony becomes just thinking about John Wooden. You know, Coach Wooden passed away in 2010, so it's been six years now. But this man and his legacy is still so relevant and so very much a part of the current coaching conversation. As we mentioned in part one, Tony's pal Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is writing a book now. It's called Coach Wooden and Me, and that comes out next year. Just last week on October 14th at UCLA, just like every October 14th at UCLA, devoted Bruins celebrate their hero with John Wooden Day on the anniversary of his birthday. And then last month at Purdue, which is Wooden's alma mater, of course, and his home state of Indiana, they unveiled a statue of Wooden outside of Mackey Arena. But what's cool is it's not just a statue, his iconic pyramid of success is also chiseled behind him too. So the veneration of Coach Wooden's life and his teachings absolutely still continues today. And we thought, what a better time to give folks a window in and a chance to listen to his voice and hear for yourselves why John Wooden's philosophies are so time-honored and they continue to be revered and modeled and passed down still today. So let's get to it. Listen to Tony Robbins interviewing the great John Wooden in the second half of this two-part interview. Enjoy. If you use the bench and and don't don't antagonize them. You can't antagonize and get positive results in my opinion. So You've got to do it in, in manners that you try not. This particular one of the greatest boosters I have. Wow. And uh, yet... Because he knew uh, you were fair. And, yes. They must know that you're fair. Yes. They, they won't always agree, but uh, another thing I always try to point out, that when we when we disagree, do we have to be disagreeable? I don't think so. I yes. think we can disagree without being disagreeable. Gracious sakes, if we didn't disagree on something, we should be terribly monotonous. And we're <laughs> well, all somebody's different. not necessary. Yes. There's never a disagreement, yes. right? I, I interrupted your flow, though. You were saying the other things that you really look for in a player. You were saying the unselfish attitude was where you were. Well, first, the, uh, the quickness uh, yes. from a physical point of view and the unselfishness uh, yeah. for uh the overall they're the two main things yes. there are a lot of other things you say you're looking for size well 
Yes, but like people say, I've had people say, wouldn't you like to have uh, two Al Cinders? And I said, no, I'd rather have Al Cinder and Mike Warren. Yes. A 510 and a 72. Yes. Rather than 272 or two 510s. Yes. That gives me balance. So I'm always looking for balance and trying to balance things out. Now, all coaches want the same thing. You want them big and quick. Yes. But where many of them would give up some some quickness to get more size, I wouldn't give up some size to get more quickness. I mm. wanted my guards to be quicker than opposing guards, my forwards to be quicker than opposing forwards, and my centers to be quicker than opposing centers. I didn't expect my centers to be quicker than opposing guards and so on. Right. But um, uh, that's the one thing more than anything else that I'm looking for. In a prospect that has the grades to get in UCLA, that's the first thing you always look at. First is, can he get in? If he can't get in, I don't care how good he is. He's no good That's right. <laughs> as far as you're concerned. Right. What was the creed that you gave them? One was to be unselfish, but I know you had a creed that, just like the one you carried for yourself, that you reiterated, I think, a time and time again with the players. Well... I'm not sure of, of what you're referring to there, Tony. Okay. I had different things, little things that I uh, put on the bulletin board from day to day. Uh, at one time, I gave all my players a notebook. A very, uh, I had a lot of things in the notebook, and I, I, I noticed that it was getting a lot of dust in the lockers, uh, <laughs> some of them. So I cut that out, and I'd give them a little material day by day. And I had something of normal expectations, and that might be what you're yes, referring, that's what to. I'm referring to. There were just a number of things in there, to, like the one in the creed: make each day your masterpiece, and do the best you can each day, and and never criticize a teammate. I was very strict about that. No profanity. Uh, those things mean dismissal from the floor of practice. And uh, if you miss practice, you're going to miss playing time. Yes. And uh, uh, a number of things like that. Always compliment a player uh, that scores and not necessarily have to score for other things. If you score, never fail to compliment a player that maybe set the screen for you or gave you the pass or got the outlet off of the board at the other end, compliment. And I had a player one time say, uh, I, I'd say, don't run over and shake his hand while the other team goes down and gets the basket back. <laughs> right. but, but you can give him a nod or a wink or a smile or a point. And I said, um, one player asked me one time, said, what if he's not looking? And I said, I guarantee you he'll be looking. If he's not, I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What was really the secret to your consistency? I mean, you won seven NCAA uh, AA titles in a row. You had teams, I think four of those teams, that literally had perfect records. They didn't lose a game in the entire season. I think you had three additional teams, only lost one game. How did you produce this incredible level of consistency? Everyone wants that in life. How do you create it? There's no secret at all. If there is a secret, it's to have the personnel that can do the job. Yes. Then the second thing is to be able to get it out of them. No coach ever uh, did it extremely well consistently unless he had the players. Now, I I'm not naive enough to say that players are different in ability and coaches are all the same. Yes. Because coaches aren't all the same any more than surgeons are or writers are or commentators are. or People aren't the same. But no one, absolutely no one, can do it unless they have the personnel with which to work. And then now the big thing is to get it out of that personnel and get them working together as a unit and uh, make, putting, the, putting their own physical abilities to use for the group as a whole. That is the big job. And since every youngster is different, and thank goodness... Uh, that's true, but the Lord saw fit to make it that way. We're all different. We're, we're, we're similar, so yes. similar, but we're not identical. Even yeah. identical twins aren't really truly identical. So that's uh, what the coach has to be constantly working toward is to try to analyze, study each individual, and then work with them accordingly. My college coach, I think I got that from Moore. Uh, he did a tremendous amount of just individual counseling not calling you and talking to you for an hour but maybe one or two comments on the practice floor to me right. to this person to this one to this one and things of that sort and uh, which i didn't see at the time but later on i i in in retrospect like a lot of the things my father did i didn't see at the time but later on i see where it had uh, uh, it was meaningful yes. and uh, subconsciously it helped in ways that uh, i didn't see and didn't understand so um I think in, uh, in trying my best to not permitting them to live in the past, 
to take, in a sense, each day uh, as it comes, each game as it comes, and trying, working hard toward that one point in, in the creed my father gave me is trying to make each day a masterpiece. And that means just doing the best you can every day. You can't do more than that. Uh, I've heard coaches say he gave 110% or 120%. Nobody ever gave 110%. They don't have it. <laughs> you can't, 100% is perfect and no one's perfect. So you can't even get 100%. I had an interesting thing. I was on a panel back in Boston with uh, the late George Allen and Red Auerbach, uh, the famous coach of the Boston yes. uh, Celtics, and, and myself. And George Allen was speaking, and he said that uh, he demanded 130% from all his players for the Washington Redskins. And I said, um, uh, Coach Allen, I said, did you get 130%? And he said, what do you mean? Sure. And I said, well, I, I felt that I never was able to get even 100% out of any individual. I was never able to get 100%. I was trying to get as close to it. I thought 100% was perfect, and I just want to know how you got 130%. And he said, uh, Coach Wooden, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> You're messing up his rap. <laughs> Tell me, you told me what success means to you. What's failure? Failure is knowing that you didn't do the things that you should have done. Mm. That's failure. And you're the only one that will really know. It's like character and reputation. You're the only one that really 100% knows your character. Your reputation is what others perceive you to be. And uh, it can be different from what one's character really is. And uh, so I think failure isn't looked at that way. For yes. example, success, uh, Mr. Webster tells us, comes from the accumulation of material possessions or the attainment of a position of power or prestige. I don't believe that. Yes. Uh, I think they uh, might be, I think they could be indications of success, but yeah. I don't, don't think they necessarily are. To my way of thinking, in my analysis, an individual is the only one that will truly know whether or not they're successful because they're the only one that really knows whether they've made the effort to make the most of what they have under the conditions that existed for them and, and trying constantly to, to improve the existing conditions. Uh, too much of the time, we complain about what we don't have. And as soon as we do that, then we're not going to make the most of the things that we do have. Yes. And if we make the most of the things that we do have, that's going to bring us some more of the things that we don't have at the particular time. But hmm. I think that's a tendency for us to do that an, an awful lot. So I, I think success lies, again, within the, uh, within the individual rather in the eyes of others. I, I talk to people very often who have become, quote-unquote, successful by cultural standards, as you define it, and uh, some of which that are considered to be, quote, at the top. And yet, rarely do I find them very happy. And uh, often the number one thing they say they're looking for is the very thing you mentioned earlier, which is peace of mind. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give somebody who's, quote, made it to the top and still is missing peace of mind? <laughs> to look around for things that they can feel that they're really helping others in some way, and there's always ways. For example, uh, in the history of our civilization, Many wars have been fought and billions of lives have been lost because heads of state differed with others or leaders of some sort in regard to religion or race. Yes. And we know that's true. And uh, I think if those people in those leadership positions really had more consideration for others, those problems would never have been as severe. They'd always be problems. But uh, I think that these prejudices today, and they exist that you and I, and you, and you, others are all somewhat responsible unless each and every day we try to do something in our own little way to alleviate unjust prejudices. Now, people say, what can I do as an individual? You can't do much as an individual, but boy, we're not individuals. We are many, but are we much? And we become much when we all contribute in our own uh, little way. So I think uh, people that have uh, seemingly reached the top of their particular profession or are perceived to have uh, yes. reached it at, at least and don't have a peace of mind, it's because that they're always looking on the other side of the street. 
And I think you should always be uh, trying to do better. And no matter how well you've done, that yeah. doesn't mean you still can't do better. And you should always be trying to that. Although I know that there comes a time when we go downhill a little. We don't go uphill like that. We may go downhill pretty fast, but we can we can slow it down to some extent. By constant demanding and improving upon ourselves. That's right. Right, that makes sense. Each and every day. What is a coach? Well, they've been defined as many things. They've been called many things. You know, <laughs> called by, many things is true. <laughs> by different people. But uh, to me, uh, what a coach really should be is a teacher. He's just a teacher. And he's, he's a teacher just as an English teacher is, or a biology teacher is, or a physics teacher is, or a math teacher is. He's just a teacher. He's trying to, to teach youngsters under his supervision uh, to... Uh, uh, make the most of the abilities that they have in this particular thing and realizing that the individual abilities that they have are going to be meaningful to others mm. and, and not just for themselves. And if you become so uh, wrapped up in yourself and lost in your own narrow tunnel vision, lost in your own egos, which we all have to some extent, and I think our strength lies in in our ability to uh, to keep our egos down. Yes. But I think we should all have some. We should all have a, a ego to some extent. It's pride, and we should all have some pride. But we but should we, earn it. Yeah, that's right. We should not let it uh, get get out of uh, a perspective at all, which uh, the tendency uh, might be at times. How do you know when you've done a good job as a coach? Amos Alonzo Stagg was asked by reporters after one outstanding season he had, well, aren't you really proud? Is this, is this uh, probably your best job? And he said, well, I won't know for 20 years. Hmm. So it's what your youngsters do after they've left your supervision that really determines whether or not you have done a good job. On a smaller basis, not as meaningful, when you watch your team play, how they play, do they play the way that you've tried to teach them to play, coming close to that? You can judge, feel whether or not I've done a pretty good job. If you just base it on the score, no. I felt that we have been in games that we outscored our opponent that, in my opinion, we lost. And we've been in games where the opponent outscored us yes. that I felt we've won. We yes. did. We came close to our ability. I, I, I did a pretty good job of helping them reaching the, their, their maximum ability that I could expect at this particular time of the season. Yeah. So uh, I think that's your job as a teacher. In the mid-30s, I read something that said, uh, no written word, no spoken plea, can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves. It's what the teachers are themselves. And that's what a teacher, a coach should be. I think a coach has a responsibility to be a model, to set an example. And those that don't, I don't, in my opinion, don't think they should be working with our youth. You know, I think one of the most important things to teach anyone and to be a model of is how to deal with disappointment because they're inevitable in life. And I think when most people think of you, Coach Wooden, they don't think of disappointment because you had so many victories. But the truth is you spent almost 16 years before you had your first national championship. And I don't think most people really think about those 16 years. Most people would give up or mm -hmm. some coaching careers are over in 16 years. No one would have known who you were. So how did you make it through those 16 years before you finally had a championship? And what happened to those 16 years? Did you continue to learn and grow as that why you created the momentum that created those 10 national championships? I'd like to feel that I learned every year. Yes. I feel that there were some years prior to our winning our first national championship that we would have had a, a better chance to win had I known what I knew when we did win. Yes. And I think there was a time when I wanted to win I'm kind of ashamed to say it, but it's the truth. And I wanted to win so much that I hurt our chances by perhaps overworking our players yes. or by trying to give them too much. Yes. And once we did start where we were winning national, now we won a lot of conference championships. And from the winning point of view, I had nothing. People didn't perceive me to be a failure. Sure. They didn't perceive me to be a failure, you know, Tony, until we won 
at one time two championships in a row, and then the next year we didn't win the conference. Then I failed. And then no. we win seven in a row, and then we lose to, uh, to North Carolina State in a double overtime in the final four, the champion who lost only one game all year, and then I failed. And then we come back and won the championship the next year, so I left as, as, as you know, being a winner. But had we lost that last year, I'd go back to a loser again. <laughs> I remember reading in your book, you said the more successful you become, the more criticism you hear, the more suspicious people are of you, and the more they expect, you know, from you, and they appreciate you less. So what what advice would you give to people that are succeeding and in terms of how to deal with this, and also how can people deal with disappointment? Because even though you were a winning coach, you still had disappointments. How do you deal with those? I asked you two well, questions, actually. Yeah. I dumped two big ones on you there. Well, that's another thing that I tried to get across to my players, that... Uh, at times, they're going to be uh, receive criticism that won't be fair, won't be just, and you won't like it. And you're going to receive a criticism that really you deserve. You won't like that either. <laughs> but there are going to be times when you're going to receive uh, uh, credit and praise that you really don't deserve, but you'll like it. Mm-hmm. And even whether you deserve it or not, you'll like it. But your strength, your absolute strength as an individual in my opinion, will be on how you are able to cope with both criticism and praise. Hmm. If you let either one get out of hand, it's going to affect you in, in, in a very bad way. Don't let the good things go to your head and don't let the bad things defeat you. There's always another day and that the next day can be a good day or it can be a bad day and you're responsible for it. How did you deal with disappointment yourself? Because I know you had it. What did you do to keep that balanced? Well, I tried to keep it within myself. And, uh, uh, for example, um, if I'm trying to teach the idea to my players to not uh, let either uh, their emotions show, then I must try to do that myself. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, there have been various times when uh, Nellie, my dear wife, was interviewed. Uh, she said, John never brought things home. Yes. That he separated his profession from our home. His family came first with him. And I don't know whether that's uh, true or not. And I, I dare say it isn't true 100%. But at, at least I was pleased that she felt that way. Yes. And I tried not to. Well, I don't know. Uh, perhaps my early upbringing, I learned to accept things and didn't get myself... Uh, too perturbed over the the difficult things that would happen, but figured that maybe their type of learning and and will be helpful to me in the future. I didn't do it a hundred percent, of course, but sure. uh, I don't think I let disappointment get me down. So you try to learn from it. You seem to have the ability to put it behind you rather quickly. Maybe because your focus was on improvement. I remember in 1960, you had, I guess, one of your worst seasons. Yes. It was like 14 and 12. Was that That's the, right. That's my and, worst um, season. That pain that you experienced was kind of like the bench for the players, from what I understand for you. It drove you pretty intensely, didn't it? Well, uh, Sam Balder, who was a sportscaster here, had said before that season, if UCLA has a winning season next year, I'll push a peanut the entire length of, of the Miracle Mile with my nose. <laughs> so when we finished 14 and 12, uh, in some sense, I might have felt better with that particular team than I felt with some other teams that maybe won a national championship. Perhaps they came closer to their potential. Yes. And I never felt, for example, while that's my poorest year of coaching, it definitely was not my most disappointing year. Yes. It's the poorest year from a one loss uh, yes. point of view. Yes. But it's not the most disappointing year. But I had disappointing things. But uh, my disappointments were not so much uh, from things of that sort. My disappointments came through maybe knowing that I had failed with some particular youngster for some reason or uh, uh, something in my family. Those were my disappointments or disappointments in some players. When I, If I lose a player for some reason, that maybe it could have been avoided if I'd have handled a, uh, something a little differently and things yes. of that sort. Those yes. were my disappointments. And I just had to accept them that I'm going to have them and I can't let them affect uh, the future. 
from my understanding in 1960 you really committed to revamping and improving everything you were doing now at that time is that true yes that's true uh-huh. yeah. but it, it had nothing to do with that particular uh-huh. uh, season that way it had nothing to do with that as a matter of fact I might have um, revised a little more my thinking after the end of our 62 year in which we made the final four mm. because I learned so much in that uh, in, I think in that year uh, in, in, in different ways that I hadn't learned before and I did uh, make some changes then in my practice uh, procedures uh, and uh, uh, limiting the number of players that I used mm-hmm. until games were really won or lost. Now, from that time on, I tried to tell all players that there'll be seven or eight players that are going to do most of the playing until the game is, uh, the outcome is settled. Yes. But that doesn't mean those that aren't going to play aren't important. You are very important. The yeah. nuts and the, and the wheels. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. right. Yeah, and, uh, and that's, that's, but that's the job is to get them to believe that yes. and go along with you. So that's that's the more difficult type of things that you with which you have to cope tell me a little about your pyramid of success that you shared with your players i talked to them over the pyramid once a year before a couple of weeks before practice started and asked them to come in and uh, discuss it with me if they had any aspects and some years no one came in some some years some came in but uh the sort of uh, surprising thing is i don't think there's hardly a player that talks about it after he got out that said he didn't understand it at first but he had found it most meaningful after not too long ago Kareem Lewis uh, was uh, interviewed and they asked him that question about the pyramid and he said he thought it was kind of corny when he first heard it and yes. uh, later on uh, he saw it was a little more meaningful and he began to see it a lot as he was finishing but it had its greatest effect after he got out of school well that's pleased me now that derived from the fact that after I entered the teaching profession, I didn't like the way of judging the success of my English students. A or B was right. successful. Most of us are average, you know, and C is the average grade. And yet, parents seem to think that uh, a C is appropriate for the neighbor's children, <laughs> but, but not for their own. And uh, if their youngster didn't get an A or B, either their youngster had failed or the teacher had failed. And yes. I just didn't think that's fair. I... I believe in the good Lord and his infinite wisdom didn't create us all equal as far as intelligence is concerned any more than we equal as far as size or or appearance. We're not born in the same environments. We don't all have the same opportunities. And I didn't like that. And so I began searching for some way to what I thought could make me a better teacher and give the youngsters under my supervision something uh, to aspire to other than just a higher mark or more points. Yes. Then I think from my father's influence, I developed my my uh, definition of success. Yes. And in 1934, I started working on that, and I put success, according to my definition, at the apex, and then I started working on the foundation. I, at that time, I don't know how many blocks I'm going to have in it or whatnot, but I did select, in 1934, the two blocks that I selected as cornerstones, and one is industriousness and the other is enthusiasm. And I just don't think anyone can come close to, to reaching their, their level of competency unless they work hard at it, unless they like what they're doing. Yes. And I worked on this for the next 14 years on developing it, and I had many ideas, and some I discarded, and some I kept, but maybe placed in a different position within the structure, because each block is placed in a position that I think is important, like the foundation, the cornerstones, must be strong. Any structure, is, if it has any strength, solidity must have a strong foundation, and of course, the cornerstones anchor the foundation. But in between those, I placed three blocks that include others, and we include others who are adding strength, friendship, loyalty, cooperation. Yes. And then the next year, I put four blocks, I ended up with four blocks. Just when I ended up with five, then I started working up. The first was self-control. And the next one was alertness. Being alive and alert and seeing things are going around you. The next was initiative. Not being afraid to fail, knowing you're not perfect and you're going to fail at times, but you'll learn from them. And then the, the fourth block was intentness, and that's determination or persistence and not giving up. Yes. And then in the heart of the structure, I had three blocks, and one is condition, mental, Moral and physical. Yes. And then the skills, being able not only to uh, be able to do what you're doing properly, but to be able to do it quickly. Whether you're a surgeon or you're an athlete or an attorney or whatever it might be, you have to do things quickly as well as properly. And then the third is listed as team spirit, and that's consideration for others and working together for the welfare of all and, and trying to put uh, yourself back of it a little bit. And then... 
The next two blocks I have poise and confidence. There again, uh, to do well, you've got to believe in yourself, you have to have confidence, and you have to have poise. And, and I, I also coined my own definition of poise, which you've probably never heard. And, and I think poise is very, it's a very simple thing. And it, to me, poise is just being yourself. Mm. I think uh, you're not acting. Makes it a lot easier. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not acting, you're not pretending, you're not trying to be something you're not. Therefore, you're going to function near your own level of comfort. Now, these things all lead up to the last block, which is competitive greatness, mm-hmm. being competitive. You can't be competitive if you're afraid, if you, if you, uh, if you don't enjoy a challenge. Yeah. But you, you won't have competitive greatness unless you're conditioned, unless you have all these blocks below leading up to it. Yes. And then next to that, uh, leading up on the apex. That's the last block. But from the last block, I have patience on one side. Good things take time. And the other's faith. Mm-hmm. Faith that things will work out as they should. And we're getting back to the question you asked me a little while ago. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, we must have faith that things are going to work out as they should. But if we must do what we should do, too. Yes, yeah, so we have to make sure we do our part. Right. Tell me a little bit about how faith has uh, shaped your life. I know that um, that you have deep religious convictions, and I know that you've consistently lived by those convictions. I wish I could say that I had uh, as much as you feel, Tony. I've tried. I have a deep and abiding faith that things uh, work out the way they're supposed to which is sort of like we talked about a little bit earlier, why, I don't know. But uh, in my particular faith, uh, the two commandments uh, are sort of a uh, tie-in. The first one is, uh, there is the Lord whom you must believe in, and the second is the golden rule. Do unto others, you'd have others do unto you. Yes. That's briefly what they are. Yes, very yes. Briefly. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, or as you've referred to him, uh, Lou Alcindor, was when he played for you. Um, tell me, what was the impact of your relationship? I, I know you had a deep impact on him, but what was his, the impact of his relationship on you as well? I'm curious. I believe we learned from each other. I never had anyone like that before. From a physical point of view, and uh, not too many from uh, other aspects too. The background and so on. And... Uh, I had no realization of uh, what a tough situation it is for him at times when people would uh, make uncomplimentary remarks within his hearing. I heard one one time say, look at that big freak, look at that big black freak. How did he deal with that? How did you deal with that? I wanted him to know by my actions that that was not my belief and I was critical of those that had. And when I heard... Uh, someone make remarks, I would let him know of my displeasure of it and how wrong it was, but let's not judge other, as I told him one time, you know, you astonish people at times, and uh, sometimes uh, when we're astonished, we'll say things that we don't really mean, but don't think all people are like that. I believe, as I would tell him and I've told others, I think most people are good. I believe that. Yeah. I still know that we have to have penitentiaries and policemen and all that, the laws. But most people are good. But I also know that there are uh, lawyers that are disbarred every year, but I think most lawyers are good. I know that there'll be doctors that lose their license every year, and I think the Hippocratic Oath is a tremendous uh, thing that I've read. And uh, whatever the profession, most people to me are good, but not all. But let's not condemn all by the actions of a few. So some things happened along that line that I would talk with him about. First trip we made to one school in our conference, I always would be last out of the dressing room, and he he usually would come out last and uh, along with me, and he must have signed. Uh, I, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say 30 to 40 autographs for youngsters, and then I said, Louis, we must go. We're playing somewhere the next night. We've got to get on the bus and go. And he'd say, sorry to the youngsters. And then he'd walk away. In the big, and here would be adults, say, in where you're here. Look at the big so-and-so, too good to sign autographs. When That's all he'd been doing. Mm. I never envisioned that before. I didn't envision the fact that he can't have an aisle seat on a plane because his legs are too long. I didn't envision the fact that he can't buy clothes and you may have some trouble that will fit him yes. in uh, stores like most of us can. Yes. I didn't envision that the tables he's got to sit sort of on an end where he can turn sideways. I didn't envision the problems we were going to have getting beds 
at that time. Now they have many, many uh, extra long beds, but they didn't have when he played for me at that time. And sometimes we couldn't get him. We got a king size bed and it's crosswise, and uh, sometimes put chairs and pillows at the end mm. to make them a little longer. Things like those, things of that sort. But the main thing that I didn't realize was sort of like man's inhumanity to man, the statements that would be made that he could hear. And I hadn't, I hadn't envisioned these things happening. So I learned. I think I learned more tolerance uh, in things. He was very bright, you know, very yes. bright person. And uh, extremely fine team player and no problem at UCLA in any way. No problem in any way at all. Coach, what for you is one of the toughest times in your life and, and how did you turn it around? The toughest time in the life that I've ever had is the loss of my dear Nellie. Yes. And that was, that's been hard. That was uh, six years ago, last uh, March 21st, first day of spring. You were married for 52 years? We were married uh, going on 53 years. It would have been uh, 53, our next anniversary. But we'd been sweethearts uh, since I was a sophomore in high school and she was a freshman. Uh, just one of those things uh, when we met uh, there was just some sort of I think before too long maybe without either of us realizing it we'd fallen in love in a sense Yeah, and uh, it never changed and losing her was difficult but uh, uh, what changed it around was not me but others my children and grandchildren and friends uh, doctor yes. uh, minister I think all uh, led. For a year or two, I had a rough time. Then I miss her just as much as ever, need her, love her as much as ever, but I'm wrapped up in my great-grandchildren and my children, and I go on for them. But that's been the toughest, most most difficult uh, thing that I've ever ever experienced in any way. What beliefs did you develop to turn that around? What new beliefs did you have about the situation? Did you develop any? I think prior to that, to some degree, I had a fear of death. Yes. I have none now. Wow. None at all. Why is that? I'll be with her. You'll be with her. What other chance do I have to be with her? Wow. Is there any other way? No. I'm with her somewhat as I go around the room because in our condominium here, which she picked out and furnished, I have made a change. The only thing has been addition of great-grandchildren, which she never got to see. Otherwise, there's no addition, no change. It will not be, and I won't move. She really was uh, your coach, wasn't she, Coach Wood? Oh, she was a tremendous help. Uh, Going back to our high school days, uh, uh, it might be hard for most people to believe, uh, but I, uh, as her parents said, that they had never known anyone as shy as I was. I was very shy. Really? And uh, she recognized this, and uh, she got me to take uh, speech and uh, public speaking in high school to try to help me. And that was difficult for me uh, to begin with, but it was of help, and it was good for me. And uh, she was of great help. And then uh, later on, when I uh, graduated and went to Purdue and uh, found it a little discouraging. Uh, there were no athletic scholarships in those days. And I wanted to become a civil engineer. It was my ambition. And there was probably the reason I went to Purdue. And I didn't know that you had to go to summer camp every summer to get your degree in uh, civil engineering. And uh, I was going to have to work in the summertime. I knew that. I couldn't go because you didn't get paid for that. sort of like uh, uh, laboratory, I was suppose you'd call it. And uh, so I... Uh, I, I was blue and, and down a lot, and she was her encouragement that uh, I might not even have finished school. If, uh, wow. And, and I had no problem ac- academically. I was a good student, and I'm, I'm very proud. Of, I'm more proud of my basketball playing and the fact that when I graduated from Purdue, I received the Big Ten medal for the graduating athlete with the highest grade point average. And I'm proud of that. Fantastic. And, and uh, more so than being a basketball player of the year. And, and, I like that too, but uh, the other one is more, much more meaningful uh, to me. Then, after we were married, when I got out... Uh, you made it through the Depression together? and Yes, tough, but uh, she was understanding. She wasn't demanding about things. Things were not the most important thing in her life at all. What made her special to you? <laughs> to me, she was the cutest, prettiest girl in the high school, and I <laughs> saw <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> Why she's elected me, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, she was just special because of her understanding, and I, I, I suspect that earlier she saw, probably saw me, saw through me, 
more than most uh, anybody else. And uh, <laughs> my last year in high school, our high school coach uh, came up one time and talked to her mother and dad. And he was afraid, knowing that we were in love, that we might get married and I might go to school. And he said to her parents, Now, you wouldn't want Nellie and John to get married and, and, and John end up by... Not that there's anything wrong with it, but maybe working at a filling station, making 18 or $20 a week, which wasn't too bad then. But you wouldn't want him to do that for the rest of her life. And Mother Riley said, uh, she thought, and she told us about this, but she said, I thought, oh, if he can only make 18 or $20 a week, I'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, she was just special in so many ways. Uh, uh, she cared for people tremendously. Very much, yes. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe there could be a better wife or mother than, uh, than Nellie. And she loved people. She was, she was good. She may have been your greatest success coach. Well, I'd have to say that. I'd go along with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> she believed. She was there. Uh, always there. Yeah. She provided some of that certainty that sometimes you needed yes. as support. Yes. What, yes. what advice? Would, I'm sure you guys had challenges in 52 years. Oh, of course we did. Um, what advice would you give people living in a society today where people think of a relationship as being long-term that's two years old? What advice would you give to help people uh, stick to it and make a relationship work? Listen. Listen mm. to the others. Communicate. Don't keep things all hidden. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you disagreed, don't be disagreeable. Talk it out. And, uh, of course, the final things. Love. Yeah, it's always the base. Mm -hmm. What is uh, your most treasured memory? Things with Nelly. Uh, just various things. Uh, nice. are, the, are the most treasured and then with our children and family yes. the things that are family oriented are my, are my most treasured uh, memories what do you value most in your life now? Uh, while I'm living for my family my children and uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren they have given me reason to go on and to do things and not become a sort of a hermit like a person and I'm pleased that so many of my ex-players are in contact with me and yeah. ask me about things what are the most important lessons that you've pulled from this life that you think would be valuable to share with your grandchildren and to share with just people as a whole so difficult to answer that but I would say that among the things that I think are real real important and maybe I haven't lived up to them to the degree that, that I should have and that is that, uh, being concerned for others, being considered for others, the golden rule. Yes. Uh, being considered of others uh, uh, maybe covers a multitude of uh, uh, things. Well, they say there's a mystical law of nature that the three things that mankind crave most are uh, freedom and peace and uh, trying to think what the third one is. But at any rate, you can't have any of them unless you give them to others. Hmm. Uh, Maybe the third one's love. Yeah. <laughs> you, you say um, there's many things along that line, little sayings that I'd like to pick up uh, here and there from uh, the vision of Sir Lonfall. But it's not what we give, but what we share. Hmm. For the gift without the giver is bare. Who gives of himself with his alms feeds three, himself, his hungering neighbor, and me. Uh -huh. And uh, there's so much truth in those things. You can't live a perfect day without doing something for another without any thought of something in return. That's wonderful. I believe those things. I'm not that I've lived up to them. Don't misunderstand me at all. Well, you've cer I you've certainly things. pursued them on a regular try, basis. I try. I know you've said often that something to the effect of that success is only the result of the lasting things in life. Yes. What's, what's your actual phrase? Well, on that is... Um, Real happiness and success comes from the things that cannot be taken away from you. Hmm. And in material things, you lose. Yes. In time, you're going to lose material things, but it's the other things that are, uh, and that you never lose love. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins and Mary Buckheit. Carrie Song is our executive producer strategy and distribution by Anna Yorg and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Copyright Robbins Research International.